Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us today uh, to this event. And thanks to the online audience for tuning in. My name is Tamara Kharoub. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and Senior Fellow at Arab Center, Washington, DC. I'm pleased to welcome you to this press conference releasing the results of the recent Arab Public Opinion Survey focusing on the war in Gaza. As you know, today marks day 125 since the Hamas attack on October 7th and since Israel began its war in Gaza. As of today, Israel has killed close to 28,000 Palestinians, the majority of whom are women and children, with 67,000 injured, 1.9 million displaced and facing torture, famine, infectious disease, and the lack of health care and humanitarian aid. As people in the Arab world watched Israel's dev devastating war on Gaza with the full support of the United States, we sought to conduct this survey to gauge Arab public opinion of the war and of the U.S. position towards the war and its impact on U.S. policies, interests, and relations in the region. I will start with presenting uh, the results of the survey, and then I will turn it over to uh, the panel of experts that we have with us today. Um, and my colleague, Yusuf Munayir, will lead the discussion on the implications of these data for um, U.S. policies and interests in the region. So let's take a look at the results. This poll was conducted by Arab Center Washington DC and our affiliates, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, in order to gauge Arab public opinion about Israel's war on Gaza and US role and policies towards the war. Uh, the poll is part of a larger uh, survey. It's called the Arab Public Opinion Index, which has been conducted annually in the Arab world since 2011 and is the largest public opinion um, uh, survey covering the Middle East and North Africa region. Looking at the sample, um, the sample size was a little over 8,000, um, 8,149 individual respondents in 16 Arab countries who were polled through uh, phone interviews that were conducted between December 12th, 2023 and January 5th, 2024. And here you can see the list of countries and the sample size by country, averaging about 500 uh, in each country. In terms of the sampling method, each survey used a randomized, stratified, multi-stage clustered sampling method, such that every individual in each of the 16 countries had an equal probability of being included in the sample. The Arab opinions uh, were calculated as averages of the 16 countries in order to avoid the opinions of citizens in the most populous countries to prevail over the others. And lastly, uh, the overall margin of error was between plus minus 3% and plus minus 4% for the individual country samples. Now moving on to uh, the survey results. I will not go through everything in the report. Uh, but you all have or should have a copy of the full report uh, with you and can uh, look at the, the full uh, data. And for those who are um, joining us online, you can find a copy of the report on our website, arabcenterdc.org. There are five sections and I will go through some of those. First, looking at the general drivers and impacts of the war. The majority of the Arab public uh, believes that the reasons behind Hamas's attack on October 7th are related to the Israeli policies against the Palestinians, including the occupation and the siege of Gaza. Uh, note here that uh, the Arab public does not believe that Hamas was carrying out a foreign agenda like that of Iran or was motivated um, by stopping the normalization uh, agreements between Arab countries and Israel.
Looking at um, what the Arab public believes are the main factors enabling the continuation um, of, of the war, U.S. military and political support for Israel topped the list with 50% um, of respondents considering it the most important factor and 13% considering it the second most important factor. In terms of the impact um, of the war on the prospects of peace, 73% of um, the Arab public overall does not believe that there's a possibility for peace following this war. Um, looking at um, the Arab public's evaluation of positions um, of regional and international actors towards the war. The US um, was viewed most negatively, as you can see here, at 94%. Uh, followed by um, some European countries and um, the Arab public evaluation of Russia and China's positions uh, was almost evenly split, while Turkey and Iran were viewed re relatively more positively than, uh, than the others. When asked uh, about the countries that pose the biggest threat to the security and stability of the region, 51% of respondents said that the policies of the United States were the most threatening, followed by Israel at 26%, while 7% um, believed that Iranian policies were more threatening, and 4% uh, said that it was Russian policies. Uh, the consideration of the US as the biggest threat increased after um, Israel's war, uh, on Gaza, as you can see, compared to the previous years, this is the highest um, negative evaluation. Uh, looking at the Arab public's evaluations of the positions of Arab countries, um, you can see here um, there's a variation um, with um, Qatar receiving uh, the most positive evaluation and the uh, United Arab Emirates receiving the most negative. Um, when the respondents were asked uh, about their opinions on what measures the Arab governments should take in order to stop the war in Gaza, 36% stated that Arab governments should suspend relations or normalization processes with Israel. Then we asked the respondents some very specific questions about their views of the U.S. position. The data show that there was a shift in Arab public opinion of US policies in the region after the war, with 76% reporting that their opinions became more negative after Israel's war on Gaza. Similarly, Arab public evaluation of the US response of the war is overwhelmingly negative when looking at the different countries surveyed. As you can see here, the division by country. And 81% of the respondents believe that the US is not serious about working to establish a Palestinian state in the 1967 occupied territories. In addition, the majority of Arab respondents believe that the U.S. policy towards the war in Gaza will harm both U.S. interests and U.S. image in the region. The last section and the last set of questions um, has to do with the Arab public opinion regarding uh, normalization of relations between the Arab countries and Israel, which for the last three years, um, before October 7th has become the main policy priority uh, in the region of both the Trump and the Biden administrations. Even now we see the administration pushing for Saudi-Israeli normal normalization uh, in the midst of war. So first looking at uh, the Palestinian issue in general, the data show that um, after the war, there was a significant increase in support for the Palestinian cause across the region with 92% believing that the Palestinian cause concerns all Arabs and not just Palestinians, which is a significant increase from the previous years. It's a 16 point increase from 2022. 
This percentage is also the highest recorded since 2011, which is when the question uh, was first asked as part of the uh, Arab Public Opinion Index. When looking at specific countries, um, in, in some of those countries, the shift was very prominent between 2022 and the war. For example, in Sudan, it jumped from 68% to 91% of those who believe that the Palestinian cause is um, a cause of all Arabs. In Saudi Arabia, it went up from 69% to not last year to 95% in this survey, and in Morocco from 59% to 95%. When asked about support for recognizing Israel as part of the normalization agreements, the majority disagreed at 89%. When looking at the responses um, to this question over the years, uh, we also see uh, uh, a significant increase from previous years. Uh, there's a five point increase between last year and this year after the war. Of particular, particular note is the increase in the percentage of those who oppose recognizing Israel in countries that have joined normalization processes or were about to. For example, in Saudi Arabia, um, from 38% uh, in 2022, uh, who opposed the recognition of Israel to 68% this year, or, or this uh, survey. In Morocco, 67% last year, 78% now. And in Sudan, from 72% last year to 81% now. Um, and other countries, there's also a near consensus in Jordan, Egypt, and Palestine uh, in opposing the recognition of Israel. And here, uh, the population that was surveyed in Palestine was in the West Bank, uh, including East, East Jerusalem, not in Gaza, obviously. Uh, to conclude, this poll recorded significant changes in Arab public opinion of the US and its policies becoming more negative across all countries as a, as a result of the war on Gaza, including uh, regarding views of the normalization agreements. And now I will uh, turn it over to uh, my colleague, Youssef Munayir. He's the head of the Palestine-Israel program at Arab Center Washington, DC, and a senior fellow. Um, and we will move on to the panel discussion. Thanks to the panelists for taking the time to join us. And we look forward to hearing their analysis of the implications of these data. Youssef. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Tamara. I do want to just take a moment to introduce uh, our panel, uh, and then we'll jump right into our conversation for today. Uh, at the end of the table here, uh, Dan L. Kurd, assistant professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Richmond, and also a non-resident senior fellow uh, here at the Arab Center. Uh, next to her, uh, Professor Shibli Talhami, who's um, uh, the Sadat uh, Chair for Peace and, and Development and the director of the Critical Issues Poll at the University uh, of Maryland, and also part of our academic advisory board here at the center. And seated next to me here, uh, Sarah Yerkes, who's a senior fellow at the Middle East Program uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thank you all for being with us today. We're gonna have a little bit more of a conversation uh, about these results. We also uh, look forward to engaging with our audience, both in this room and uh, online, where I know we have a, a significant audience as well. Uh, you can send in your questions later on on note cards here in the room. Um, and for those who are watching online, you can send in your uh, questions by emailing them to events at arabcenterdc.org uh, or using the Q&A feature uh, on Zoom. Um, so very, very eager to discuss this uh, with you all. Um, a lot of different data here. Let's let's start with, I guess, this question. You know, most respondents um, see the United States as the primary reason that this war continues. Um, despite talk about a ceasefire, many trips to the region by senior U.S. officials, um, people not only seem to see these efforts as inadequate, but specifically see the U.S. as the main reason why this war continues. What impact do you think this moment will have over the longer term for the reputation of the United States in the region? 
any anyone can jump in and feel free to you know um uh to to comment um on each other's perspectives here you want to get a starter shibley um uh, sure I, I i mean um thank you first of all for for holding this it's been it's interesting to uh, read these results and and think about them um i would say um you know most of them are not surprising uh, in a way, we didn't need in a way public opinion polls except to confirm them, because this has been obviously what what we have known taking place in the Middle East in the terms of public reaction, uh, even non-public reaction, including government reaction, uh, journalists reporting at, as to what's happening in the Middle East. And, you know, I, those of us without polling could see that this was not just a moment that is the Gaza war, a moment where people are simply kind of thinking about whether they like or dislike American policy, but really a historic moment where maybe uh, this is impactful on the on the um, perceptions of a whole new young generation in the Arab world in a way that is likely to last way beyond the moment. Um, and I don't take that lightly because as you know, I have done a lot of my own polling in the Arab world for over a decade during a very challenging period of time, uh, at, right after 9-11 and, and throughout the Iraq war. And those were very painful times when Arab public opinion was very angry with the US and also very angry with governments for not preventing the war and for supporting the US. And, um, and so, uh, the way in which this is a little bit different um, is that I think that um, is possibly impacting the way governments think. And this is the question that we have to ask. So if you if you look at the shifts in terms of anger with American policy over time from year to year, the spike that come out of the war is not going to be measurable much because I mean, Arabs have been angry with American foreign policy for a long time long before this war. And you could see it in your polling in the previous years. So therefore, the, the extra few percentage points you're, gonna, you're going to measure are not necessarily going to be the ones that are going to make the difference. It's not, it's not going to add a lot. So the real question is whether the intensity of anger is on a new scale mm. uh, in a way that could have behavioral consequences, both for the public in the Middle East, and for the way the public influences governments in the Middle East. That's really the big question. Um, and whether or not the events themselves have really shifted the way governments think, not just because of maybe the way their public uh, sees uh, the, these issues, but whether it created their, therefore a, a, a shifting, shifting strategic environment. So I would have liked to have seen it teasing out uh, that one would uh, would use to measure the intensity about the intensity of feelings rather than just anger and who's winning. None of us were surprised that uh, some of this, uh, you know, loss of even more confidence in the U.S. is going to lead to increase in the influence or better views of America's opponents globally, China and Russia. Uh, this, by the way, coincides with the views of scholars of the Middle East in this country, in our uh, Middle East scholar barometer, when we ask uh, what is likely to be the outcome of American policy toward Gaza, uh, in who's likely to benefit, who's likely to lose, not surprisingly, scholars too think that there will be a rise in the influence of China, Russia, and Iran, as you've found in this poll. So that particularly is not surprising. So the, the, for me, again, the question here that we could all discuss, and, and I'm sure my colleagues have thoughts on, how do we measure that intensity? Will this really make a difference for the behavior of governments that have historically, including in crises like the Iraq war, like 9-11, have been able to by, bypass public opinion uh, and, and pursue strategic interests that are not necessarily connected to the issue at hand? Go ahead, Dan. Um yeah, um, thank you so much for starting us off, uh, Shibli, about with with this kind of overview. Um, my thoughts when I saw the, this poll, similarly, I was not surprised. Um, 
I would say that there the differences between approval for the United States and like Iran, Russia, um, those have medium term implications for like U.S. strategic interests. Um, that's very clear. But I also want to point out two things. Um, one is that um, this largely kind of more long term um, is going to is, is playing a huge role in like the erosion of l- the liberal rule based order. Um, and that's having an impact, particularly because I study activists and and and, and kind of dissent. It's having an impact on um, Arab Democrats. Um, so those people who advocate for human rights, who advocate for democracy. I mean, yes, largely they've been decimated, exiled, et cetera. But despite this, like there are people who espouse those values. Um, how do those kinds of people then, you know, go back to their publics um, and advocate for these values and reject the Iranian role, for example, or reject Russia's policies if the power that espouses those values, the United States is perceived to be so hypocritical. Um, And this is especially uh, a harsh contrast for a lot of Arabs, um, given the context of the US uh, response to Ukraine versus the US response to what's happening in uh, Gaza. The second thing is, um, I think this point about like, how will this actually impact people's like behavior? Um, I, I, I think this is oftentimes assumed to be stable but I don't, I don't think it is at all stable. Um, and we know from the Arab Spring, we know from even more recent waves of protests in 2019 that like um, protests can and do happen on a large scale. Um, people who study protests talk about things like moral shocks and stuff like that. This word certainly uh, uh, is generating that kind of moral shock to uh, you know the Arab public. And Palestine, in particular, the Palestinian issue has been such a gateway to dissent in the in the in the region, and has often played a role in facilitating broader protest um, and and um, giving people a space to talk about their broader grievances with with Arab governance. So um, I just think that I think the assumption is that you know well, they can be contained, protests can be contained, or it won't really be that impactful on uh, um, on the states or the regimes themselves. But I think that this is a big assumption to make. Do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, just picking up on some of this. Thank you for having me. This is really interesting. I echo everything that's been said. Uh, you know, this wasn't, nothing was surprising, but it was concerning. Um, and I think a couple things on the impact on potential U.S. behavior, as well as relations between the United States and some of the Arab states. I mean, first of all, I think, you know, what we are seeing play out is more and more daylight between the United States and Israel in a way that I think is frankly very new and actually has some opportunities for the United States. I mean, I think one of the the reasons behind the anger of uh, a lot of the Arab public opinion is the lack of U.S. using its leverage over Israel. The United States has really just sort of allowed Israel to do what it wants to do, you know, has not pushed back against Netanyahu. And I think we're starting to see some cracks here, whether that's the the floating of the idea of recognizing a Palestinian state by the United States, um, you know, this new executive order pushing back on settler violence, things like that, that are, you know, should be obvious and should be things that have been done a long time ago, but have not been done by a U.S. administration. And so starting to see that the United States might might be shifting towards more unilateral action if it's not going to get Israel to do what it wants to do. Um, but I think one of the biggest pieces um, to take away from this is the impact of the United States to push on democracy and human rights in the region. And this is sort of picking up on, on Dana's point that you know there hasn't been a lot of U.S. democracy promotion in the region of late. But that's become almost impossible to do now. The you know the claims of hypocrisy, this idea: who are you to tell us, you know, to do better? Who are you to tell us to be acting in this way? That's not going to fly right now. And there's been a lot of pushback from Arab publics about that. Um, and then finally, I think one of the really interesting points that Dana made that I want to pick up on as well is this idea of dissent and protest. You know, this the Palestinian cause, the re, sort of reawakening of, of this cause on the Arab street has been a real sort of pressure release valve for Arab autocrats. You know, it has allowed people who are not always allowed to go into the streets and protest to go into the streets and protest. And in a way, it's taking a lot of pressure off some of the Arab autocrats. So I think in a sort of tangential thing to be paying attention to in the long run is what does this mean for the stability of some of these governments that seem to be a little bit more fragile pre-October 7th? Uh, And then finally, the last point is um, that I think it'll be interesting to see what impact this has on the government-to-government relationship that is U.S. to Arab governments. Because while clearly 
Arab public opinion is very much against the United States and its role. We haven't yet seen that carry over to U.S. Arab relations as far as the sort of government to government level. And again, in, in countries where you have largely closed civil society, where you don't have a lot of governments listening to public opinion on a regular basis, we may not expect this to actually translate up into having much of a substantial impact on U.S. relations with Arab mm. governments. I uh, I did want to uh, note one thing about Shibley's question regarding uh, measuring intensity. Um, you know, part of the the broader results of this, and we focused on presenting the pieces that are uh, most uh, sort of relevant to U.S. policy. Um, but one of the questions that were asked in the larger poll are about sort of emotional health during this time, uh, and the ways in which people are feeling as they're watching all of this, which perhaps can be something of a uh, of a proxy uh, for uh, for measuring uh, intensity. And as you might imagine. Um, uh, it was particularly dark. Um, so, uh, you know, part of part of that is also because of how people are consuming information about what is happening. Um, we've heard this described as the first genocide that's streaming live. Um, and we uh, are seeing not just constant coverage of the events on, on the ground in the Arab world on satellite television, but many people are also receiving news directly from uh, social media. Um, and one of the questions that we, we look at here is about sort of how people are receiving information. Of course, satellite television has been dominant in the Arab world for, for quite some time, but about 36%, which is a very significant number, uh, are getting their primary information about the situation on the ground from social media. I'm wondering how you all think that that um, dynamic is shaping the perspectives that we are seeing at this time. Yeah, I, I think this is really a great question because obviously the source of the media is extremely important question. And um, it is important here, you know, for those of us who do polling in the U.S. So I have, uh, for example, when I'm do polling American public opinion, uh, I'm always asking, what is your source of news? Um, and I go through, you know, satellite television, I even break it down, which ones, and uh, social media versus print media. And, and part of it is that we know there's been a huge shift that's taken place uh, toward more social media slash internet, and especially among young people. And young people practically don't watch television um, much here. And in the Arab world, that tends to be true as well. So those 36 percent, a lot of them are the younger people who obviously use social media. But the one thing I want to make clear, and this was something those of us who studied the Arab uprisings uh, and sort of what drove them, because obviously the social media was critical because it could, took the governments by surprise. How do you get a million people to go to the Harir Square, despite the fact that there's so much uh, repression in the system? Well, you know, that that's one of the elements that obviously helped organize and galvanize and, and so forth. But when you look at it carefully, those of us who studied it, it was always a marriage between different medium, including mm -hmm. social media. So uh, so those people who see who go to social media often are actually getting something from uh, TV uh, or from, you know, from satellite TV and so and. Uh, and satellite TV is often taken something that was picked up as happened in the in the Arab uprisings. Uh, someone who took a a street view on their phone in 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 Tunis and sent it to them, or they picked it up from social media and they broadcast it on satellite media, so that other people who don't have social media have it. So it's not one or the other. It's all you know all of these things. Uh, and uh, I think that obviously we know that has had a major impact, particularly here in the U.S., not just in, in the Arab world, because in the U.S., if you ask me what are the most important things that show a huge difference between young people and older people on this issue, I would say sources of news. The fact that we have sort of mainstream establishment media that has a particular pitch, but social media has a completely different uh, outlook and, and diversity. And you, you see that in the Arab world as well. What has happened as well in the Arab world is I would say a revival of Al Jazeera. I would even say in this particular case, when you the, the results were presented about sort of who's playing you know, a more supportive role of Palestinians and, uh, and Qatar emerges as, as Number one, I've put that a little aside because honestly, I think it's tied to Al Jazeera. Mm. And the reason for Al Jazeera here 
is that it has always been important, as you know, from its inception. It, and then it, it during the Arab uh, uprisings, it, its influence diminished with a lot more conflict. Uh, this has revived, uh, you know, uh, because revived it in a big way because they have so many reports in 24 uh, seven in a way that is impactful. I find myself, um, Watching it again far more frequently than I uh, that I did in you know last year or the year before, uh, and I think that everybody is impacted by it, uh, and I think that it's you know it's really both and and because that's true, so it's taken it's taken uh, market share from other media, m with from other media outlets, they're trying to emulate it as well. So you find a lot more coverage of Gaza and other media to take market away. So. Yes, I think the coverage has been extremely important in the way people are having their views shaped. Do you guys want to jump in on that? I can say something. Yeah. Um, so, yes. So um, I think social media has a couple of different impacts. The fact that it's a source um, obviously has pretty big impl implications, a, a larger source, I mean. Um, obviously... As, as it was kind of implied in a lot of the discussion already that like social media does uh, facilitate a broader range of information, kind of democratizes information to some degree. So like people are going directly to the source and seeing things in Gaza uh, and seeing journalists in Gaza. Um, at the same time, um, so so that that's a good thing. And then like in certain countries also, um, I remember at the beginning of the war, like the uh, Emirati channel, the, uh, the Emirati based channel um, gotten a lot of hot water online because they used particular terminology to describe what was happening on the ground. And, and um, so I think like the average Arab media consumer can see that and then bypass it and go and go uh, look for information that um, uh, more aligns with what they want to see. Um, but at the same time, um, social media is highly controlled uh, and is also highly skewed in the sense that it's very hierarchical and top heavy. Um, so there's a lot of research on social media that uh, shows um, that a few accounts can really skew the conversation and control the conversation. Um, and th this has implications for what kinds of information people are getting. Um, and also governments have learned to control this, these spaces like they they didn't let the Arab Spring slide. Um, they definitely have learned to uh, weaponize that space and, and use it for repression. And finally, these are private companies. And so there's a lot of these like algorithm issues, shadow banning, and like lots of uh, pro-Palestine um, activists have have documented and, and, and uh, noted that. And in this particular conflict, for lack of a better term, um, there's just a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Um, and I think that's why we see, um, whether it's the Arab Public Opinion Index or like other uh, polling in the Palestinian territories, the Palestinian Center, Center for Survey and Policy Research, we see that um, uh, um, respondents saying that they don't believe uh, the you know the 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 details of October seventh. Like there's a high degree of non-belief uh, in in some of uh, um, those details. And um, yeah, so um, I we're talking about Arab public opinion index. So we're talking about Arab respondents, but I think this is a issue for American, uh, uh, you know, media consumers as well. Mm. Yeah, just to add one quick point, which it's not unique at all to this issue, but that, you know, the social media, the increased use of social media reliance on social media just leads to more and more polarization. And I think what we're seeing in this conflict, particularly in the United States, but, you know, is just tremendous polarization mm -hmm. um, around the conflict. And I think a lot of that is due to exactly the issues that Dana and Shibley were talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. One question that I um, was really interested in from this poll, and, and uh, you know, we wanted to ask it for a very specific reason. A few days after the 7th, the President of the United States gave a major address about um, the events uh, and really um, set the tone for the American response. Um, uh, and and I, I think that had a tremendous impact on shaping uh, opinion. Um, and uh, a lot of American officials and American media fell in line um, um, within that framework. One of the things we heard from the president in that speech, and we've also heard echoed by Israeli leaders, is this comparison of Hamas to ISIS. And in fact, the president in his um, uh, speech uh, said worse than ISIS. 
And when I had heard that at the time, I thought that this is a tone that is going to immediately be rejected in the region. Um, and it, it turns out when we ask this question of respondents in this poll, um, you know, what, what do you think of this comparison? Uh, only 3% thought that there was, uh, you know, any, any um, equivalence to draw between Hamas and ISIS. And the vast majority said that they are entirely different. How does the tone that the White House decided to take in responding to this issue, um, how does it account for the way that it's being heard in the region? Um, and do the do the views of the people in the region, do the perspectives of the people in the region seem to have mattered in setting that tone? Yeah, you know, I think... Uh, um... I, when I when I read uh, the question uh, in your poll uh, on this issue, um, I found it interesting, obviously, but I wish there was a follow up. Mm. Um, and that's where I wanted like very badly to know why the public think it's not ice like ISIS. Um, is it simply is it because of the ends or because of the means mm. or both? Um, and the ends, I mean, obviously, the, the argument has always been in the Arab world and, and among people who studied both say, you know, Hamas is a, yes, it's an Islamist organization that uses militant means, but it is, quote, a nationalist organization focused principally on uh, the Israel-Palestine question versus ISIS separate from the means that it uses uh, is a global jihadist organization. And the two are not identical at least in terms of their objective focus and operational choices um, uh, regardless of the means or is it really about the means that they're so what is it that 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 the public is really saying it's not like isis and i don't know what the answer whether it's a mixture of both or one i wish there was more more of that i am not sure uh that um that that comparison is what um you know animates our public opinion when they hear it or even if they heard it from 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 biden it could obviously is a disagreement i suspect um uh that it it goes uh it goes way beyond although um you know if you look for example in terms of uh the popularity of hamas and look at not just in the arab world but in the polling like the one that was done by Khalil Shukak in the west bank and gaza where there was an increased popularity of Hamas. Um, I don't remember ever seeing a poll where ISIS or for that matter, Al-Qaeda were popular across public opinion. Uh, so I, I don't I don't recall even the polling that I have done in the past during those 10 years that I did polling where you had that kind of popularity for either one in, the, in, Amer in our public opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason, my understanding of why that terminology was used initially um, was to emphasize the different ta that this is not sort of even Hamas's normal behavior. This is something that goes beyond. I mean, I think this is one of many early missteps that the U.S. has sort of tried to, to course correct on. And I don't think they've used, they've referred to Hamas as being like ISIS since then. Um, but I, I, mean, I tend to agree. Surely. I don't know that that particular rhetoric is driving much of this. I mean, I I think it was something that was caught up in the moment of the sort of the early days. I think that's fair, but it was not, it was certainly not the only thing at that time, right? There was uh, statements by the secretary of state who said, you know, I'm coming here to Israel first as a, as a Jewish person. And then as the, you know, for, as an American and so on. And there was a, a number of statements that seemed to cast this as a religious conflict or an existential conflict and not something that, has sort of pre-existing causes and drivers, right? Um, you know, I, I want to uh, uh, ask a little bit about sort of the direction moving forward and some of the things that we've heard from the Biden administration um, as a way to try to uh, respond to these uh, events. Um, and we've heard a lot about the need to revive a two-state vision uh, to try to get conflict resolution quickly back on track after the war. 
Um, most of the region, the questions that we ask, uh, on aggregate, close to 80% of respondents believe the United States is not serious about this effort. Um, how can such statements um, you know, be made uh, from, from the United States when facing such a credibility crisis in the region? Trying to get my thoughts together. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the point I was trying to make initially, which is what where I think the United States has a long way to go to gain credibility. Um, and I think you know this is where the United States potentially needs to act more unilaterally and just you know recognize a Palestinian state, like figure things out with. Don't stop sort of um, waiting for Netanyahu to to take the lead. I mean, I think that the United States is is going to continue to face this understandable belief that they're not serious about a two-state solution, that they're not serious about a peaceful resolution or the desire for a Palestinian state if they don't start acting on it. And, and this is, you know, this is, again, not unique to this conflict, but where the United States often forgets that they have more leverage over other countries than they do over them. And I think that, you know, there's been too much of this kind of allowing Netanyahu to drive the the U.S. position when in reality, the United States should be driving its own position and should be taking actions that enable it to get where it needs to go. But yeah, I think this, this just confirms again that despite possible rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration that they are serious about some of these things, they're not acting on those, that rhetoric, and they need to do something to show that they are. Well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the reemergence of this idea, particularly in this moment, I mean, this is not new, right? This this idea of the United States taking this step to potentially recognize a Palestinian state or perhaps, you know, voting a particular way on a membership application at the United Nations. That's that's not especially new. And the argument against that has always been, well, you know, you don't want to prejudge the outcome of negotiations and 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 so on and so forth. And and there was always this sort of um, more conservative uh, approach that ended up winning the way in terms of that decision. And yet now to do so, uh, you know, in this particular moment seems like the extreme opposite of that sort of the most rash possible response that that you can make how how do we explain that this you know that this is coming up again so um uh, i yusuf as you know i i um edited a book in which you have a contribution earlier this year called the one state reality and um and then followed up with an article in foreign affairs um last may um on this issue, which is what drove um, my interest and my colleagues' interest, the, the four editors of the, of the volume, uh, was exactly the thing that we uh, saw that there is a, a prevalent one state reality uh, that was deeply unjust, that is being essentially covered up by what we call the smoke screen of a promise of two states to not to avoid dealing with the reality as it exists. That was the thing that drove the project and led to another article that we would. I have another article coming out in Foreign Affairs with Mark Lynch um, in the coming issue, which hopefully will be released as early as next week, on this very issue as to what would come next from the Biden administration. Um, and the the fear, of course, that we have had, there, there are two fears. One is that, uh, are you doing this really just to avoid dealing with what exists? First of all, is this, you know, in fact, the intent? Why are you doing it, you know, with good intention, but really not realizing that people are not going to trust you or believe you, and they're going to see it as a smokescreen? So let's put that issue aside, you know, what, whatever is driving it. There is no, uh, you could see from your poll, right? People aren't going to trust promises. So people are not going to say, uh, I, oh, yeah, now that, you know, we've witnessed all this and what you've done during the war, what you've done before the war, and now we're going to trust that you're going to work towards something in the future, uh, and for which you're asking us to give you something up front, like the Saudi-U.S. relationship, right? And that's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to work with the public. No one is going to buy it. Um, and I, I would even say something like, um, you know, if I had to, if, if in fact I did believe two states is still possible, I think you would have to do something today, not tomorrow. It can't be a promise. It can't be something delivered up front uh, that's irreversible. And is the Biden administration capable of doing so? I don't see that in what I've watched about the Biden administration. I just don't see that capability. And one of the interesting tests that we're going to see very quickly will be about the push to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia 
again. Now, let's be clear, and, and we really should be very clear here. This war is not over. In fact, any talk about you know what we should do next is distraction from a horrific catastrophe that must end first. And it hasn't ended. Uh, our efforts should not go into thinking about, quote, the day after when there's no day after on the horizon. And even beyond what might happen in Gaza in the end, if there is an end, uh, or the West Bank, um, uh, we could still have an all-out war with Hezbollah, between Israel and Hezbollah, that is going to even make, you know, distract from anything that has happened in, 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 in Gaza, and possibly even draw Iran or the U.S. in. So we are not, you know, th this, this whole conversation in a way is not only uh, untimely, but it is counterproductive in a way, because it, it sort of takes you in a direction that distracts from what we need to deal with right now. But the, to the extent that there will be a conversation, and it's starting already, particularly in terms of having a Saudi-US normalization deal, that's going to be the test to which uh, public, is, public opinion has impacted the conversation. Are the Saudis going to insist on something now, or will they be comfortable with saying something tomorrow? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that will be the real test for has this uh, horrible crisis uh, led to a, 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 a public uh, so activated in the Arab world, including in Saudi Arabia, that governments are just not going to uh, do things that are going to go against the core core feelings? Uh, that, that I, to me, that's going to be the first test we're going to have. I want to get to some questions on normalization, but Dana, go ahead. Um. Yeah, I. Uh, it's interesting. I think it was like two days ago that the Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs put out a statement saying that like they they want a state, they want East Jerusalem as the capital. They're not going to have a discussion until that happens. And you know who knows? Um, these are personalistic regimes, uh, largely unaccountable. But th that's what they're saying right now um, regarding the two state solution. Um, uh, there is very little appetite, not only amongst the Arabs that are being polled or like Palestinians and other polling, um, but also amongst Israelis. So um, I think a Gallup poll very recently showed that, um, you know, 60 something plus percent uh, refuse a two state solution. Obviously, at the decision maker level, there is no discussion of a two state solution. Um, so there's really no appetite there. Um, that doesn't mean that the United States can't take these kinds of um, positions and, and maybe push for something like that. But I think we need to be careful about what it means to pursue a two-state solution, not only in, as you mentioned, like in terms of distraction, um, which is why uh, Palestinian activists, some of them based in Gaza, circulated a letter a few weeks ago saying like, there can be no political solution under the cover of war. Um, but also because I don't think the United States has ever been um, fair uh, in, in terms of its mediation and what it means by state. Um, so it has lost a lot of credibility due to that. Um, they've been talking about a two-state solution, um, but pursuing something less than a state. And I think that that's what Arab public see and what the Palestinian public sees. I think they also lost a lot of credibility um, before any, you know, any of their statements after October 7th. They lost a lot of credibility with the normalization deals that they were already supporting. Like before the discussion about Saudi and Israel, you know, began in earnest, um, they they didn't really reverse any of the Trump administration's normalization policies. In fact, they threw their weight behind them. And I and that also was um, a huge blow to the credibility of the United States as like a mediator in in a future process, whatever that process might end up being. Um, but the fact is, like, there is no other country that has the leverage over the, over Israel. Um, and so with this kind of inaction and inability to be fair and and like clear about the words we're using we're we're just um really inciting more mass violence do you want to get on that sir? no okay um just want to remind folks in in the room that they can send uh questions uh up on their on their note cards and also for those watching online that they can send uh their uh questions in through the the chat feature or the q a feature and um, via email at events uh, at arabcenterdc.org um, one of the things that sort of 
jumped out when looking at these uh, results is uh, an increase in support for the idea of Palestine as a, as a pan-Arab cause. And this is, of course, something that has always been resonant in the region. Um, but 92% of respondents in this poll see it that way. That is the highest number in any year that we have data for going back to 2011. We did not see a similar jump after the 2014 war uh, or in 2021, which was another significant moment. Um, this moment seems to be genuinely different in the extent to which it has drawn the region back to focusing on Palestine. Why do you think that is, and what does that mean for the normalization effort? Uh, as you know, uh, in in a previous book, I uh, I called the Palestinian issue the prism of pain through which Arabs see the world. Mm. Um, and I think for a long time, certainly uh, since 1948, um, Palestine served as that prism of pain uh, through which Arabs often subconsciously evaluated the rest of the world. Uh, who's on our side, who's against us, who we like, who we don't like. Uh, it's kind of a subconscious evaluation that people do uh, uh, to shortcut, to evaluate uh, governments and, and leaders and positions across the world. Uh, and that was the case pretty much. And there was a lot of polling evidence suggesting that it was the case for much of um, Arab history. And obviously, certainly during the Pan-Arab era, which uh, obviously passed uh, long ago. Um, but I think the question was, what happens after the Arab uprisings? And... Um, uh, not only because, uh, you know, uh, there were divisions in the Arab world and different priorities, um, but because suddenly, you know, even the Palestine issue seems to not be the scene of obvious suffering, obvious suffering, I say, because meaning, you know, death and destruction on the scale that we were seeing in many of the countries that were going through the Arab mm -hmm. uprisings. Uh, and that was those horrible scenes. And, and you know, one has to acknowledge uh, the suffering across the entire region that had nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian issue during that period. And so we all understood that that period of Arab history, that decade, I would say, post-Arab uh, uprising decade, was going to reshuffle priorities in some ways, um, meaning at a minimum in daily, uh, you know, ways, the Palestine issue is not going to be on people's minds. Um, they, you know, people, they have survival issues, they have hunger issues, they have uh, political issues, they have immediate things that have to do with them. And I have always argued that that was not going to mean that people care no longer about Palestine, but that to the extent that Palestine is not actively you know, in in the in the in the news in in a, in a way that uh, galvanizes them, and to the extent that they have immediate priorities, that that's not going to be the one that is going to animate their politics or their opinions or their relationship with the governments. Uh, but I never believed, and I have always argued, and certainly argued in in my book, the, the World Through Arab Eyes, uh, that that issue could be revived any minute if there is a, a an explosion on Israel Palestine or a shift in politics that that so to to me it's not shocking at all uh, and obviously this moment when you say what is it that's different well people are comparing it to the nakba it was the nakba that generated that uh, prism of pain for the arab world in for decades and if this is in fact comparable to the Nakba, some people are comparing it, but I don't see what's particularly shocking about it. Uh, but it is interesting that it is revived. And I think you capture that in, in, in the poll. Uh, and we could see it from anecdotal evidence. And we don't only see it that way, we, we see it. I think what happened in this process is that a lot of people in the Arab world, and I would even say beyond the Arab world, Arabs and Muslims broadly, they, they, what they have seen through this is an episode of dehumanization of the Palestinians, uh, particularly through kind of the, the the messages that we're getting, including ones that were sent by the administration here. The dehumanization was dehumanizing beyond the Palestinians, dehumanizing 
of Arabs, Muslims broadly. And I think that in a way galvanizes people even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really should just leave this here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would maybe just augment that, like add to it a little bit. Um I, I I already previously mentioned like Palestine is this gateway to dissent, but it's I think for a lot of people it's like an indicator of like government responsiveness. Um, because they do have these ideas about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and then when their their governments are pursuing different policies, like that that kind of uh disjuncture is is what upsets people. I think I agree, like it um there is like this subconscious maybe normative or emotional uh reason that um people use palestine as kind of a, a a a way to view the world but i also think it's quite strategic um for arab respondents or you know arab citizens around the around the arab world um to care about palestine uh and what happens there not only is it as i said like an indicator of government responsiveness so how much their government actually cares about what they think but also like something like this recent uh explosion of, of kinetic violence um has had economic effects on uh the, you know neighboring countries there's the, always a the risk of conflict spillover um and we see that in the lead up to the arab spring as well um so like uh, a lot of activists that were involved in the egyptian uprising you know have have gone on record have written in their memoirs and things like this like activists like hassam al hamalawi and like ala abdel fatah who, who say like um, we realize we have to deal with our own regimes first um, before we can take action on Palestine because the, it was having this kind of um, dual impact, not just at the kind of normative, emotional commitment, political commitment level, but also on their like uh, broader um, conditions in, in their countries. So, yeah, that's what I would add. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things to add. I think, you know, I completely agree with this idea. You know, there's a gap between public opinion and what the governments are doing. And I think this is where I'm skeptical that this will have an impact on normalization because I think we've seen, there's never been broad public support for normalization. And if you look at the survey, Morocco, one of the countries that has a normalization agreement, they have gone up from 67 to 78% of people who disagree with uh, support for recognizing Israel. But that 78 is lower you know, it's still lower than it's been since 2012. So all the other years it was higher. Um, so I think this just kind of shows that, again, the governments are not necessarily paying attention to public opinion. Um, you know, the there's very, very high levels of disagreement amongst Egyptians and Jordanians of maintaining relations with Israel. But these are the countries that have had peace treaties, all the be it cold peace treaties for many, many years. So I think, well, this is, it's a very interesting development that you have this people responding to this. And I think Shibli and, and Dana really explained that well. I, I don't think it's going to lead to reneging on normalization agreements. I think we would have already seen some of that if that was going to happen. So there's a question of reneging. And then there's the question of those who are yet to normalize, but yet have been rumored to be on the way, right? Um, and, you know, one of the the key players there, of course, is, is Saudi Arabia, um, recently, as as you noted, Dana, they put out a statement, the foreign ministry put out a statement, I think yesterday or the day before that seemed to pour cold water on the idea uh, in a fairly conclusive way without what they what they uh, were were saying is recognition of a, of a Palestinian state. Um, one thing we see in these polls is a is a pretty significant shift in public opinion in Saudi Arabia in particular. Previously, last year, a large chunk of respondents uh, said they either didn't know or they didn't respond on the question of whether they would support their um, uh, their, their government normalizing with uh, with Israel. Uh, only 38 percent at the time opposed the idea. Um, but now um, some 70 percent opposed the idea. And that group that didn't know seems to have made up their mind. Um, only 29 percent now are unsure or unwilling to to answer. How much harder has Israel's war on Gaza made normalization for Saudi Arabia? Yeah, it's really, as I said, that's going to be the biggest question, um, whether or not um, uh, the monarchy will, again, you know, bypass public opinion. It's not that they haven't done that in the past and they think they can do it again. Uh, so I don't know for sure. I can't say. I think they have to be very, very careful um, uh, let's, you know, everybody remembers the Arab uprisings. Everybody remembers thinking Mubarak cannot be overthrown. 
Uh, and everybody remembers what the Saudis themselves, uh, you know, feared immediately after and did to try to protect themselves. Uh, so they can't be, uh, you know, uh, take it take it for granted. The memory of the Arab uprising is still with everyone. It can go away. Uh, I would note that uh, while their statement uh, that they issued yesterday from the foreign ministry was very strong, uh, saying we will not um, we will not normalize with Israel until the war the the, the war is over and Israel withdraws and uh, and there's a recognition of a Palestinian state. I know the Israeli press said um, until there is a Palestinian state. That's not what they said. So uh, it, it's a big difference between recognizing a Palestinian state. It's and, not. It's not the and, Arab Peace Initiative. No, I mean, and and it is. It is basically saying, as you know, the UK is uh, already said. The foreign minister, uh, foreign secretary, said uh, that the UK is considering recognizing a Palestinian state. Um, there are reports that the State Department is one of the options is considering uh, uh, recognition of Palestinian state, which would be important. Don't dismiss that. That would be a hugely important hugely important consequential move, at least psychologically, and it would make it really harder to backtrack from that. So I don't, you know, that's big. It's not It's not something minor. I don't think Biden is capable of it anyway. But it's quite a different because it, it doesn't mean that you go from a recognition to real establishment of a state. You still need a big process along the way. And if you're delivering the normalization at the start of that process, and you don't know where it's going to go. It's it's not quite the same thing. So we, we have to keep that in mind. There's a lot to watch for in the evolution of the Saudi position. It also happens to be an election year, yeah. Which which is uh, something that that uh, undoubtedly impacts the timeline of a lot of these decisions on both sides, right? Of right. of these bilateral relationships. Definitely, Dan or Sarah. Did you Sarah? Did you want to? Yeah, I wanted to actually just mention a different country that has been thrown out every so often about potentially normalizing, which is Tunisia. Mm -hmm. um, and Tunisia has been a really interesting case to watch over the past couple of months because they initially, Tunisia has been one of the most vocally pro-Palestinian countries. They hosted the PLO for a time. I mean, this is not surprising, but President Saeed himself has been very, very vocally anti-Israel, anti-US position when it comes to um, the war. And they've taken an interesting tack. I mean, I think what we've seen from them, they put forward a law that was going to criminalize normalization with Israel. And the president himself then pulled it back and prevented the parliament from passing that law. The president himself also prevented a Tunisian citizen who used to head their anti-corruption commission from leaving Tunisia. to. He was supposed to be one of the lawyers representing Palestine at the ICC. And the Tunisian pre president prevented him from going. So all this just to say that I think it's not as black and white as I think we sometimes think that there's a lot of nuance to some of these decisions. And I think, you know, the Saudi cases is the one we keep reading about, but there's a lot of the various countries that are considering normalization. It's not quite as easy as we might think it would be to just to say, no, we're done with this. Um, I guess all I would really have to add to this discussion at this point is um, I, I don't think that, you know, I think it is a big test, like you mentioned, what the Saudis will do. I don't know that the statement that they put out has much to do with public opinion as to like getting some what they want out of the Americans. Um, but um, back to the non-response rate. Uh, in 2017, when we did their public opinion index, um, we did a list experiment um, where we were trying to figure out like, why is there such a high non-response rate all of a sudden? Because it did come, it wasn't the same uh, prior to 2017. And it really is like a fear response. Um, like people are afraid to speak about this issue and afraid to respond uh, uh, directly about this issue in a way that they hadn't before because the government had given this indication that like red lines had shifted around that, that issue. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that normalization won't happen between them because the discourse, like the Saudis can um put out a particular discourse like i've i've heard it uh um mentioned in in some of these spaces like we want to save the palestinians we want to um we, we want to normalize so that they're not at the mercy of the israelis and and so that that is a discussion that um could have some traction with with public opinion but at the end of the day whatever comes out of this normalization deal it seems like they might name it like a state 
or say we recognize a Palestinian state, but like it's it's not a state by any of the characteristics we <laughs> consider stateness having. Um, so that I think that doesn't resolve any of the problems. And I think it's problematic that we continue to talk about normalization when um, it's clear that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict needs to be addressed directly. Uh, one of the uh, one of the interesting things around the normalization, the way the public thinks about it in this poll, is that you know we we see obviously tremendous support for Palestine in the Arab public, higher than we've seen in uh, previous polls. Um, the the level of attention that they're paying to this conflict um, and the war on Gaza is extremely high. Uh, the emotional distress that people are experiencing throughout the region is noted in these polls as well. And when we ask respondents, what do you want your governments to do about it, right? The number one answer is not provide military aid to Gaza or announce military mobilization or even send aid to Gaza without Israel's approval. The number one answer is suspend relations or normalization with Israel. Uh, why do you think the public sees that as an effective tool in this moment? Well, well first of all, it, while it is the number one, remember, there are 30, only 35. So it's like one third who say that, right? So that's interesting in and itself because it, the focus is on Israel and the relationship with Israel. So I actually have to think about it in both ways here. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's talked about for two reasons. Um, one is that um, uh, while the public doesn't think that's why Hamas actually attacked in October, that is a normalization, nonetheless, my suspicion is that the public uh, saw in their mind that uh, normalization, uh, that the Abraham Accords particularly, and then talk of normalization with Saudi Arabia that preceded the October 7th, was part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So it is definitely on the public mind. And now already we see even before the war is ending, uh, US effort are still focused on normalization. And uh, and obviously you have Arab governments um, right next to Israel, Egypt, and, and Jordan uh, who um, are evaluated in different ways by the public, um, still have their relationship with with Israel during this. So, so it's not surprising that that would be at the forefront. An interesting though point related to one of those two countries, Egypt and Jordan, is that the view of Jordan is uh, relatively positive uh, in its role in Gaza. Um, uh, and and the, and the view of the countries that normalize, UAE and, uh, and the ones that are supposed to normalize, Saudi Arabia, is not very positive in their role. So you can see that the people are linking it in, in their mind. But with Jordan, I found that a little paradoxical. And it might have to do with the fact that um, the king and the queen spoke out in very eloquent and strong, powerful ways, very upfront, in a way that captured the sentiment. Whether that lingering impact may have given them an edge, I don't know. I mean, speculation. But I found that to be an interesting thing. Yeah, I think it's interesting because in this, the question that asks the most important fa important factors contributing to Israel's continuation of the war, the number one reason is U.S. military and political support. And we saw earlier that most people blame the United States for the for conflict in the region. But what when they're asked what they should do, it's su suspend the relationships with Israel. And I would have expected there to be more of suspend relations with the United States or do something against the United States. So I think this is a an interesting divergence of the blame is on the US, but to stop it, we should suspend relations with Israel. I don't know what to make of that. I just think it's interesting. I, I think it's probably explained by, um, I mean, yeah, this is off the cuff, but I would probably explain it that like, they know that normalization is what, is what the Americans want. Um, and so like the the reason we're talking about normalization is because the Americans keep pushing it. And so like, Su suspend relations with Israel or like if you're already have you know have talks stop them because that's that's what the Americans are after so I think that has to do with that so I want to uh, turn to some questions from uh, our audience now and and please do continue to send them up or, or send them in and and you can do so with the with the Q&A feature 
uh, or via email at events at arabcenterdc.org. I'll, I'll be able to see them here. Um, a couple of questions that come, that are that sort of overlap uh, from our audience and from uh, online. Um, to to have you respond to this question about the role of religion in shaping attitudes, particularly attitudes towards Israel in the region, uh, how much of of this is a product of religious ideology, uh, or perhaps religious ideology being instrumentalized? For these purposes, um, and how much is more uh, of a nationalist uh, reaction? And that's addressed to anybody on the on the panel. Oh, I mean, I would just say that um, I think one of the questions talks about like why Hamas did, uh, like why Hamas engaged in the attack on October seventh. I can't remember exactly how it's phrased, um, and I think one of the top reasons um, that respondents gave was. Um, that um, they were protecting an Aqsa Mosque. Mm -hmm. um, so but that was the number two answer. I think the first answer was occupation. Yes, yes. yes yeah. That's so. Uh, it's not the top answer, but it is. It's uh, it's up there. Um, I think that just reflects the fact that like the only again the only kind of actors who are expressing dissent around this issue are largely like Islamist. Whether it's like, I mean, Islamists have different persuasions, but Hamas or the Houthis or Hezbollah. Um, and I think that that kind of like that framing is gaining more um, sway, I think, with people. I'm, I'm not suggesting it's the top reason or anything like that, but I did note that and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I agree with that. It's, it's really a combination of both. Obviously, people see it as essentially a, 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 an issue of occupation and 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 that's clear. Uh, in the way they see it, but there's no question that um, there is a, a, a religious motivation both in Israel and and the Arab world right now. I mean, this has always been uh, the worry about the collapse of the nationalist framing of Israel Palestine. You know, with the end of Oslo, essentially, where you know it was like two national movement trying to competing for self determination. In Israel, you have the rise of uh, religious Zionism that has become, uh, you know kind of not controlling the government. Uh, and uh, and with it, obviously, the people who've taken the initiative in the Arab world who are non-status quo have been uh, mostly uh, religious motivated, religious organization, whether it's Sunni or or, uh, or or Shia. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that discourse is not surprising. Uh, and if you, you know, if you look at um, any of these movements, um, with the slogans they have, they use slow, they use religious slogans, even as they're fighting for quote freedom or the end of occupation or or statehood or or liberation, you know all the same causes, but they are using religious slogans. So I I think there is a um a, a, a you know there, there is a religious element undoubtedly that has emerged. Uh, as many of us had expected, as we've been writing about this for a long time, what might happen with the collapse of this nationalist framing that, um, you know, that led to Oslo and then uh, continued until the, the collapse of Oslo in 2000. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, one one question I have about that is, you know, Danny, you talked about sort of the actors that are most active on this issue now being Islamist parties, right? Um, at the same time, the support uh, for Palestine uh, throughout the region has to span the political spectrum because it, you know, obviously um, there's there's such high support for it. How much of the fact that so much of this opposition is being expressed um, through these, you know, um, political Islamist organizations is a function of the fact that uh, other forms of political parties are not exactly encouraged or in, in many places really repressed throughout the region? You know, I'd love to hear Sarah's on this for for a simple reason, Sarah, because you're you know the Tunisia particularly because Tunisia is really fascinating because you got the you know the Islamists obviously championing the Palestine cause they're now being repressed. You have a secular president who's championing Palestine, so you have this kind of dialectic going on within Tunisia. How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I was actually gonna refer to Egypt, but it's similar to Tunisia as well, where, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely correct that typically, you know, pre-Arab Spring and post, 
you see a lot of the organizations, the NGOs that are allowed to operate that are given the most space are religious organizations. And a lot of the, the more secular organizations are the ones that have been more traditionally repressed. There, it is a, in Tunisia, we're seeing the flip side of that right now, where you're seeing the Anahta party being incredibly repressed. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in a way, religion is a safe space that, you know, NGOs, even under the strictest circumstances, have typically been able to operate to a greater degree, those that represent religious. And that can be like the Coptic Christian minority groups in Egypt, as well as, as Muslim groups. Um, so I think that that's part of the explanation. Oh, um, yeah. Um... I, I think that hmm, I'm, so, I'm sorry I'm trying to like get my my thoughts together. Um, you know what? Come back to me. Come back. To okay. Me. Let me write. Sure. Um, I have Let me write it down first. <laughs> we have a, a a question regarding sort of Iran's role, and um, you know one of the uh, questions that we asked sort of evaluated respondents' opinions towards the positions of different regional actors, and there was a very obvious east-west. Uh, divide there. Um, uh, I think Turkey came in sort of number one, and then Iran in terms of you know most most positive, and uh, the UK and the US um, uh, all the way there uh, at at the bottom in terms of uh, what respondents think. Um, have concerns about Iran's role in the Arab world been dissipated by Iran's support for Palestinians in recent months? You know, interestingly, um, not just in recent months, but if you look back into um, really throughout uh, since 9-11 to now, in terms of how Arab public opinion saw this issue, um, you know, certainly with um, at, at some level, uh, a lot of people have become worried about Iran for sure in the Arab world, not just because, of course, sectarianism, uh, but because with the decline of Iraq as a strong Arab state. I mean, the whole the whole Arab system about who are the centers of power in the Arab world, where Iraq was a center of power in the Gulf as seen to, you know, uh, be important in the context of Arab politics. With the decline of Iraq after the 2003 war, the rise of Iran, uh, um, you know, and even influencing Iraq itself, uh, that did uh, raise alarm, not just among Arab rulers and governments, but also among a lot of Arab people, for sure, because Iran does have strategic ambitions that sometimes conflict with a lot of the aspirations of people. Uh, but yet, when you ask the question, uh, even like you ask it here, in, you know, name the two countries that are most threatening to you personally, even at a time when we're talking about uh, sectarianism and uh, Gulf states worry, legitimate, legitimate Gulf state worries about Iran uh, after 2003, uh, that Iran was not the number one threat in the Arab perception. It was uh, Israel and the US are number one and two, and Iran was number three far behind those. Uh, it wasn't up there. Uh, so I think it's not a question of people loving Iran. It is a question of, in the, in the case, the enemy of my enemy, uh, much more than, than embracing or loving Iran. And I think we see that now because um, I am not, you know, I, I obviously, like all of us who study Middle East, have, study Iranian foreign policy and, and try to understand it. I'm not an expert on Iranian politics as such, uh, but I have, I'm a student of it in the sense that I follow, obviously, and read the experts on it. I've always wondered in my own mind whether the Iranian commitment to the issue of Palestine uh, is simply instrumental, that whether they see it as something that can galvanize, get them support in the Arab world, particularly because Arab governments are not doing that, and therefore they can you know, get to be liked a little bit more, or whether it's ingrained in the system dating back to the Khomeini era, that it's sort of part and parcel of how they see themselves and define themselves, that the, that the, this Islamic revolution in Iran will never divorce itself from that issue. It is part and parcel of the issue. I've heard, I've read both of these things, and I happen to think now to, to have concluded it's both. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, there is something deeply ingrained in the way this system emerged uh, after the, the Iranian revolution. Uh, that really tied itself to the question of Palestine, but it's also obviously been extremely instrumental to them uh, in gaining in influence in, in the Arab world. 
Um, can I just add to that? Like, um, in the last couple of, let's say, the last two years, especially after the Unity Intifada, there was this discussion in like Arab media about like unifying the fields. Um, so. Um, if something happens in, in Palestine, if Hamas acts, then Hezbollah will also act, then Houthis will also act, and Iran will also act. Um, and I mean, there have been like movements around, I mean, obviously the Houthis have taken some some action, but but really it hasn't been the unification of the fields in the way that I maybe some in Hamas thought it would be, um, or, or people who support that uh, um, framework. Um, so I think the fact that like we're seeing this in in the in the polling data, these kinds of trends, um, whether before or after October seventh, really has a lot to do with the absence of the Arab Democrats, the counter revolutions that have decimated uh, alternative visions, um, and so it's not even just Islamic NGOs; it's these Islamic militias that are are articulating alternative visions. And like, aside from like the most committed people uh, um, towards particular values, um, Iran, and especially in this time time frame right now seems to have the answer um and and they certainly have <laughs> instrumentalized the 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 cause and, and and their discourse is really um getting some uptake i think uh, um in a way that's deeply alarming yeah i mean i think iran is the one country that has been like traditionally standing up to the united states and so in this context where pe- there's a lot of anger against the united states it's not surprising that people would feel positively towards Iran as, as the one country that's actually sort of pushing back. Yeah, I mean, I think the the one thing that's that's interesting about this to me is, that, I mean, it should be on your question, is it genuine or is it instrumental? It's 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 really going to be hard for us to ever test that until it stops being instrumental. Um, and, you know, at, at this point, it certainly is, right? Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, is because the, the Iranians seem to... Um, understand uh, and have an ability to operate within Arab countries and in Arab politics, in part because they understand the importance of these issues among Arab publics in ways that um, not everybody else seems to appreciate, including, uh, I think, here in the United States. And it brings us to two of the questions that we have um, on a similar topic. They take different different approaches to it. Um, One is, okay, you know, we know Arab governments don't seem to be very responsive to Arab public opinion, but shouldn't shouldn't the United States that claims to care about democracy uh, really prioritize uh, these views in a more significant way? And the other question is, why should the U.S. care about Arab public opinion? So um, the 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 central point here is where does Arab public opinion fit in to American policymaking in the region? So, I, I mean, the the reality of it is, um, I think the President Biden probably belongs to a school which says um, uh, we don't need to pay too much attention to our public opinion. Uh, and his administration uh, clearly acted that way, uh, both in terms of setting aside differences, including uh, things that he highlighted up front, human rights, democracy, things that his Democratic constituents expected him to be pushing, uh, essentially to make deals with governments uh, that were accused of human rights violations, certainly were not democratic, uh, to create strategic alliances that he thought would advance whatever objective he wanted for the U.S. Uh, and And I think I would say... Uh, this is true of most American officials in dealing with the Middle East. Uh, they can't. They think they can't control public opinion. Uh, they they deal with the people who can deliver. And they see those as governments. And to the extent that they do care about public opinion, it is typically about whether it's going to lead to militancy that is going to backfire against the United States, or whether it's going to uh, limit the possibilities of the governments that they want to deal with. And so that is really kind of the limit. And with only time when we saw a real test of that in a big way was with Arab uprisings, particularly pertaining uh, to Mubarak in Egypt. And when President Obama um, had to make a decision uh, in terms of do we rally behind, uh, 
you know, Mubarak, or do we do we let the process play itself? This is a, an experiment in a way where uh, there is a uh, uh, a, a for historic force we have never seen before. Maybe the public will have a voice. Maybe there'll be transformation. And even then, he went there reluctantly and not really aggressively. It just in, in a way. Uh, not giving red lines, giving more yellow lines, uh, uh, and uh, and so in 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 that sense, yeah. I mean, the question is uh, uh, whether it matters, um, and I happen to think it matters. I've written a lot about that. I'm you know not not you know, going to articulate those things uh, here, but obviously it matters for mobilizing uh, militancy. It matters in in mobilizing uprisings. It matters in influencing uh, policy for sure. Yeah, it, it's interesting, too, with Biden, because he had a front row seat in the Obama administration to all of the national security challenges. But during he advised the, different. He advised His different. instinct yeah. on these issues were not the same as the president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a difficult question. Um, how should the United States prioritize these views? Yes, I think as one data point, I think they do. And I can give two concrete examples. Um, you know, one is related to the Arab Spring and, and the continued U.S. support for democracy and government's promotion. Well, it's minimal. It's there. And if you were solely going by the action of Arab autocrats, you certainly wouldn't spend a dime on democracy or civil society in the region. And I think and I, I mean, I know this as as a former U.S. official that there's a lot of public opinion survey, you know, U.S. internal surveys, but also paying attention to these sorts of things to say, you know, OK, the public does want democracy. They do want, you know, elections, whatever. And so we're going to continue to support that. But the line that's often given is we can't want it more than the public does. So if, you know, this is the, the argument that's happening right now in Tunisia, the Tunisian public doesn't want to return to democracy. Why should we want it more? And so that's that's a whole other can of worms I don't want to open. But this, I just want to give a second example um, related to, to Israel-Palestine, which is when I was in the administration working on this issue. I mean, one of the things that we were really focused on was trying to understand public opinion. This was during the um, Martin and Dick-led negotiations to try to understand if this moves forward, if we're to get a deal, what will the public reaction be? And so there was, I mean, I was part of this, there was a lot of talking to civil society people, talking to people on the ground to say, you know, what do you want? What, what should this look like? What's the reaction going to be? And so I think public opinion probably should matter more than it does. It's, it is, it's one of many data points I think that's taken into consideration when I'm making policy. Thanks for that. Um, before we close, I just wanted to give each of you a, a, a brief moment to say any final comments that you had on uh, the poll uh, or U.S. policy in this moment. I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, I would just say, just to add on to the previous discussion, is that I, I mean, I think it should matter more. I agree, um, and I think that if we want um, sustainable political solutions in the region, that um, we should probably we as an Americans should probably do less to inflame state society tensions um, in these in these countries. Um, and that is, uh, it should be a strategic interest like in and of itself, but also this plays, um, a, a, has a big impact on what the Biden administration claimed they wanted to do with America's role in the, in the, in the world um, and, and reclaim that mantle of, of a rule-based order. So yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I would just say that um, beyond, you know, these poll findings, um, my instinct and, you know, as a student of the region, as somebody who's been following it very closely and studying public opinion, uh, that this is a historic moment uh, in, in some very important ways, uh, because the scale of what we have seen and the role that the U.S. played in this particular deeply painful crisis has been so large and perceived to be so large that it's gonna leave an imprint on the consciousness of an entire generation in the region that is gonna outlast this administration and outlast this crisis. The last thing that I'll say um, is just, it's interesting, we've been talking about public opinion and there was one kind of throwaway line of this is a, an election year. And I think that's something we obviously didn't have time to get into at all, but more so than Arab public opinion, U.S. public opinion matters here. And I think, you know, again, this is a topic for a whole other debate, but um, 
there is certainly a lot of attention right now on what U.S. public opinion is around this issue, and that will continue to play out. And we will definitely be having uh, events around those issues, particularly as we get closer to uh, the election this year, to look at the role of public opinion on this issue. Um, thank you all uh, very much, Dana, Shivli, Sarah, for your uh, participation today uh, and your thoughts. Thank you also to Tamar on behalf of the Arab Center. Thank you all for joining us today and for tuning in. And you'll be able to find, of course, a recording of this event on our website, as well as the results uh, of 